Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Thompson Hitt. I'm the founder and executive director of the Consciously Parenting Project, and I am here with Christy Farr, author of Is Home Your Happy Place? And we have been talking all month as I downsize and release the things that I no longer need. Um, we've been talking all month about how to make your home your happy place, how to release what no longer serves, how to um, find your own path through all of this. So I am doing a radical downsizing and releasing, um, but not everybody is. And so we're here today to answer your questions. I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Trey has a question. <laughs> <laughs> What? He just sold the piano. <gasps> Yay! One snarky post did it. Awesome! Woohoo! That's great news. In Apollo Beach. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Oh, awesome. Okay, so this is good. That was the last big thing good. that we had that we're trying to release that we're and and yeah, Trey is the king of snarky posts. So I know I actually asked him before if I could um, hire him if he was willing to do this on a consulting basis because I think I have a lot of clients who need his help unloading their stuff. Yes. <laughs> Can we hire Snark? Yeah. I I think so. I think so. I mean, his posts are hilarious. I think you know, like I have my favorite of the day. Yeah. You know, and then I've got like my all time favorites. You know, because yeah. every day it's just he writes and it's just a stream of consciousness thing. Yes. And all of the stuff just goes away and it's amazing and brilliant and so I agree I'm so blessed to yes. have 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 that as part of my team because otherwise I would still be sitting here with you know my my clothes that are not sorted yet that are still in the bin when I pull them out of the dresser and you know we just kind of still be there so yes well and I think that's a really great point about that we haven't talked about yet, which is this whole teamwork thing mm -hmm. and the way that some people are flying solo and they don't have a partner. Maybe they don't have kids that are old enough to help in some way. And I, I think it really does sometimes require a Herculean effort to make these changes. So I have a lot of clients that are stuck because they can now see very clearly that they need to do space healing, but the house balancing, you know, space healing of the house with the realities of, you know, homeschooling or not young kids all these different errands we need to run getting food in the house preparing the food like there's all this stuff that has to happen and sometimes we just don't have a lot of bandwidth and and especially for those who have a really large backlog the idea of having to wait until they can find a large amount of time to make a big impact in their life is just not feasible and so sometimes we have to look for, can we engage our partner? Can we engage the children or how can we engage the children? And if those resources aren't available, who else can we engage? Can we find another friend who needs to do space healing and they help us and then we help them? Or can we um, hire help if, you know, if that budget allows for that? Can we ask um, friends or family member? And I think that a lot of times people feel like they're alone in this. But the aloneness isn't necessarily about not having community. It's about being in isolation because of this stuff. Hmm. So because we're talking about a home that maybe doesn't feel as welcoming as we want it to, there's usually a lot of times there's some shame around that. And, you know, I'm not saying that you have to be willing to let everybody in your house, but figuring out who you can trust and who feels hmm. safe and who can actually be a good support for you is really important. And I wish more people, um, I think that we need more, we need to, sorry, I'm fixing this so it works better. Um, we need to be willing to sort of go the distance to find the right support for ourselves because we deserve to be supported. And, and, and in, especially when resources are tight, that can feel a little bit um, limiting. I've actually had several times where people came and helped a client or helped me and what they got in return because I couldn't pay them was like that they could take the stuff and sell it that I released. So it doesn't really matter. There's always going to be a way to make it work. We just have to be willing to fight for it. Mm. Really make it happen. Really invest in ourselves in that way. 
Right. That's such a good point. You know, I, I'm, this is the first time that I've ever even sold things for my house. Right. You know, we always just release them, let them go, donate right. them, you know, whatever. And so I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying because the things do have value. And if someone is coming in and they are trying to help you, mm-hmm. then that is a way that they could be compensated. If you don't have another financial means, you know, I, I always just thought, okay, let's just get rid of it. But it, it does, it does have value. And I'm seeing that now as we're actually selling many right. things, you know, it's like, wow, we just, we just made quite a bit of money just selling off these things. Right. But um, it's a skill set that not everybody has. I mean, no. I, we, the <laughs> and I have the same um, split in terms of assets. You know, she is like my Craigslist seller. She can, I can post an ad about something and nobody says a word and she'll post it and it'll be gone in 15 minutes. And I'm like, what is she doing different? I have no idea what it is, but she just has the magic for that. And, and I don't. And right. if you have someone around who can and, and, does do that is willing to do that let them there's no reason why we can't spread the responsibilities right right and i think that that's a a really important point too is that i think moms especially feel like it's their responsibility everything is their responsibility and so remembering that we can cultivate and call to us resources and support and that we don't have to do everything on our own and maybe we can't maybe it's literally impossible but not impossible if we have support right and for some people because they don't have that support in terms of releasing and making money it doesn't make sense they don't feel safe having people come to their homes whatever if your energy doesn't allow you to do that then you can just donate this stuff just to get it out of your house right If you have to, and I say this in the book about releasing responsibly, like if you're so stuck that all you can do is get somebody to bring one of those big dumpsters to your house and you just start pitching stuff in it, is that the most ideal situation? No, certainly not. We all know we'd rather have it reused, recycled, repurposed, right? But if that's the only way out of being this stuck, get it delivered get started. Once you're started, if you feel like you're able to do more, go further, you know, if you were in the beginning, only able to just get the stuff out of the house, donate it, then eventually maybe it loosens, you know, the energy loosens up enough that you feel like, okay, I could try to sell this thing. Fine, do that. But don't get stuck. Don't stay where you are just because the, the ideal outcome here feels impossible. Mm. Yes. Such a good reminder. Such a good reminder. It's whatever you can do. Do Anything. whatever you can do to get the energy moving. And yeah. I know on some of our other calls, we've talked about, you know, starting with the drawer, starting with one shelf in the kitchen, in the, you know, cabinet, yep. whatever it is, whatever it is to get the energy moving. Yes. Do it. Yes. And there's so much hangups about, we have so many hangups about it. It's about being clean. Well, no, it's not. This isn't about your house being pretty. This isn't about Martha Stewart coming over and approving of what you've done here. This is about functional, right? So if you have a chaos in your kitchen and you just can't go there, but you can make your bathroom look beautiful, do that because that needs to happen too. You know, if you can work in your closet and you think this isn't even making my family life any better, trust me, it is. Like if that's all you can do, do it. And I I talk like, you know, if you can just imagine that when a building falls and all of that rubble is there and there's no, you know, and we say we wanted to reuse some of that stuff or we wanted to at least clear that space in that field, if I go and just say, I want all the iron out of here, well, that's never going to work, right? Nobody's going to be able to go in and get all the bricks. They're all piled, right? So you just find whatever's on the top and remove it. And then it's there and remove it. And okay, now this beam is exposed. Okay, let's pull that out. This is what space healing is like. Um, and it, it's, it's like there are things that are accessible and there are things that just aren't yet. And we do not need to give any thought to what's not yet exposed because we're just not ready to work on that. Mm. And any energy we waste thinking, well, this thing isn't really making a big enough difference. Well, you can't get to that thing yet. So you're wasting energy. Just find something, anything that you can do to move yourself forward and do that. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I'm looking around trying to figure out what, what'll be the next thing that I do. Right. <laughs> yes move my energy forward. I've, I, I mean, there's been so much movement in terms of, um, you know, the things actually leaving the house and, you know, that's all been good, but we're getting down to that. Oh my gosh, we have like nine days. 
crunch. Oh, guys. Okay. Nine, nine, nine. And, yeah. you know, the couches go away this weekend and the piano apparently will go away. And then we're going to take the things to storage on Saturday. Okay. And so, and not everything that we're taking, obviously, because we're still using um, right. our kitchen. We haven't packed any of that stuff up yet, but we're going to get as much out as we can. And then I think it will be much easier to look around and say, okay, now we need to focus here right. and just yes. systematically go through each space and yes. all right, my closet has to be empty. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And again, if you need, if what, if moving forward means taking stuff out of a certain space and putting it all in another space, like a, a sorting room, there's just nothing wrong with that. Um, there's just nothing wrong with whatever it takes. So you don't have to sort all the kitchen things in the kitchen. And I, you know, um, like I, I talk about in, in the book, I talk about the dead end zone because I, I think that a lot of times we aren't in a place yet to make a decision or we kind of know the decision, but we're just not ready to do it. Right. Cause we need to right. deal with the emotional aspect of it. Um, and so being able to just flip it around and say, okay, this isn't going to work. I have to go this way because that thing is stopping me. The key here is keep moving. So if you have to move things to another room just to keep moving, because when you walk into your room, it's like, ah. <laughs> yeah, then just move it. Like, just move it. Like what, you're not hurting anything, whatever you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. We set up a, or actually, I'm sorry, Trey set up a table. I love this whole, like there's a partner and yeah. is, I mean, Isn't life happy this oh, way. It's so great. Um, and so he set up, we have this, this um, gaudy pink table that came with the house and it stays with the house. And so we had put it outside on our patio and we had used it as a staging area for some of Trey's projects and things outside. So we, we brought it back inside for the garage sale, for the yard sale, because it was a nice big surface. It's huge. I mean, it's just, it's massive. Um, and so we then cleared all the stuff off of it from the garage sale and, you know, put it wherever it's going or, you know, if it's in the, the waiting area, we've got a, a shelf that are things that we're still trying to sell. But he put this, he put a bag next to it for trash and then he put an, a bin for, you know, recycling, you know, or, or donations and mm -hmm. then another bin for anything that we're keeping. And then he's got it loaded up right now with bins. Perfect. So that's our little staging area. So he's yeah. brought things in from outside. We still haven't gone through. And so it's, it's good. And that feels really nice to have that space. Yes. So Cause then you're going in and you can maybe make decisions that you couldn't make when it was all still sitting wherever it was sitting when this started. Um, and that stuff becomes, it come, you know, he's making sort of a little mechanical version, you know, of, of the system that needs to be executed here. It's right. kind of perfect. Right. And the oh, other thing awesome. I talk about is like gathering up with paper, especially because a lot of times paper is spread out in lots of different places. Mm -hmm. And so I'll tell people just get all the paper and bring it together. And there's something very um, energy shifting about just gathering it up. You haven't made any decisions at all. <laughs> it feels better because you're telling the paper that you're the boss instead of the paper being like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> you know, um, you're just taking control and it makes the decision making come a little more naturally once you've said I'm in control here. Right. Right. Yeah. I haven't even gotten to paper. That's another thing. <laughs> paper today. Oh, good. <laughs> no, I think we should do paper on mimosa day. On mimosa day? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think paper you're right. Mimosas. I think everybody should always have mimosas when they're doing paper. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. We had this great idea that we should do like a parenting call and just have, you know, everybody come with their parenting questions and, you know, like Christy and I apparently are drinking the same brand of red wine. <laughs> Like who knew? I just bought it from Costco and she's like, that's the same bread I have. <laughs> yeah. I have a bottle in my kitchen waiting. Yeah. So I've been, um, one of the things you know about my community is that it's, it's, it's almost all women and we're all, they're all unruly and they are, I don't know, um, such a diverse group of people that I find at times like the offerings that I have, like September is creativity month. And then I'm going to do another space healing thing starting September 9th. Yay. Yay. And, I know, I'm so excited. <laughs> and, and so as I roll through these different themes in the unruly essentials, you know, I'm under the unruly essentials umbrella, you know, certain people will come out of the, the woodworks, but the, and so I've been feeling for a while now that I would like to have a month focused on parenting because there's just so many triggers, so many issues, 
faith healing stuff, a lot of times the parenting things rise. And I just never can time, find the month that I go, yeah, this month we're going to talk about parenting, right? Because every month we need to be talking about parenting. And so when you said that, I was like, oh, we just need one night. Right. Let's do you a know? night. Let's just do a night yeah. once a month where we talk about parenting. So Doesn't that, that sound great? Yes. So <laughs> Apothic Red Parenting Night. Apothic Red Parenting Night. That's going to happen. <laughs> Yeah. All right, let's let's um, shift gears a little bit and let's talk yes. about making our home a happy place. And these are the questions that were sent in today. Um, I'm so proud of myself that last night, like before midnight, I got the email out. I set up the call and I set up next week's call. So yeah. like together, because next week, I'm not sure how together I'm going to be <clears throat> because we have nine days now. So a week from now, we're going to have less than nine days. So um so the first question um, is how to manage or let go of things that this person has been given. Mm, gifts. There's mm -hmm. a chapter about that. Mm -hmm. Gifts are interesting because, well, I'm, I, I've given some gifts in my day and I've never given a gift to someone to harness them with it until they die ever. Not once. <laughs> it's never are been meant sure? to be a torture device um, ever. And I know that there are some people who do give in that way, but that's not our problem, mm, right? Mm, so yeah. most people aren't giving from that intentional burdening place. And when someone is, it's their problem, not ours. So I've had this, you know, roundabout with my mom for years because she's the gift giver. She likes to buy things for the kids and she would buy things for the kids and then they would be in the yard sale because I'm not going to. Like when they're done with them, they're done with them. I don't care where they came from because we don't do that. And she would get mad. And I'd say, mom, like if this is a problem, then you need to reconsider like the kinds of gifts you're giving. And, or if you give something that you want back, if we're going to release it, then say so. So sometimes she'll love and cure jewelry and she's like, you can keep this as long as you want it. But when you're done with it, I want it back. Don't sell it. Um, and so it, 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 because I wouldn't concede it changed the way she was showing up in our lives. Now she may still be giving gifts to other people um, with the idea that they'll keep them forever, but she doesn't do that with us. And so it works for me, but it takes a little bit of um, persistence to change those patterns in families. And then it just, for the most part, it really is just about us being okay with letting go and being okay with um, letting go of the idea that gifts are supposed to be a burden. They're just not, I mean, they're just not. It's an act of love. It's not supposed to feel like a ball and chain. Mm -hmm. And um, when you start asking those questions, you know, is this true for me um, today? Does this still feel true for me? Gifts, just like everything that you've purchased, gifts are going to at some point maybe feel untrue for you. Sometimes gifts feel untrue the day we get them. But <laughs> even the ones that feel true the day we get them, they don't, you know, it, it doesn't mean it always will. Right. And it's right. okay to just let it go. There's going to be somebody in the world who's dying for that thing, who really wants it, who's aching for it, and it should be in their hands so that they can love it properly. Mm. Yeah, I think that was something, um, you know, even, and it, it wasn't a gift, it was my, my piano. I had someone who came and sat down at my piano and just started playing it just beautifully. Mm. And I just went, you know what? that was just such an affirmation that there is someone in the world who would be so happy to have this piano. Yeah. And, and that feels so good. And I think the same is true of gifts as we look around and, you know, okay, yeah, this doesn't really fit me. It doesn't suit me. It doesn't, it's not the thing that it doesn't, doesn't serve me right now, but it may really serve someone else, but it can't until you release it. Right. We're keeping, it's, it's like having um, a river flow by, a river of stuff, because that's the way our society is, at least here in the U.S. And there's so much stuff and it's just flowing by all the time. And we pull things out and then we put them on the shore behind us. And even when we're done using them, we just discard them and we just need to put them back in the river so they can go on to the next place where somebody's like, oh, this is what I've been looking for. Exactly. We are actively seeking kayaks of this nature right now. <laughs> you know? Like right. there's somebody who bought kayaks when they were in a place in their lives where that felt true for them that I know they're not using them. 
and why not take them off their hands and use them and when we're you know if at some point they no longer feel true for us we can let them go too but why go have new kayaks made i know for a fact i've been doing this work too long to believe that there aren't two kayaks sitting somewhere in this city that are being used right i know they are right yeah wait another month or two and you know people yeah, have less yeah. need for absolutely <laughs> a closing yeah <laughs> yeah so um yeah, yeah it's really i think it's the i think that that i know for me when i have something that was a gift I have this twinge of I'm supposed to keep it. I'm, I'm, you know, it was someone gave this to me. They were thinking of me and that's the first layer of things. Well, but I can't, I can't just give this away. Someone gave this to me. Yeah. But that just means that the way it came to you was not in your choice. That's what gift means. Mm. I didn't go to the store and buy this thing. I didn't choose it then. I didn't go and say, can I have this thing that somebody else purchased? You didn't choose it that way. Like you are re the recipient of it. And when it comes to you, you get to treat it like you've gone to the store and deciding if you want it or not. Uh, wow. That's like such a radical idea for most people that we have a choice about the gifts. The gifts. Yes. People talk about the gifts their kids get all the time. I'm like, if your child receives a gift that doesn't feel true for your family, let it go. You don't have to train people about how to buy gifts for you. I mean, if you have a relationship that's close enough to you and the person is trustworthy enough to actually work with them to figure out the best gift, then do that. But most of the time, you just make the choice when you receive. You don't have to change everybody's way that they're showing up in the world. Mm -hmm. It's really too much work to try to change the way everyone around us is showing up in the world. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> no, and, and I think for me, um, something that's been really helpful is just acknowledging the gift, the intention behind the right. gift, and blessing the person, and then letting it go. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. I had a, I had a I had a book that a friend of mine gave me. It's um called The Gift of Nothing, mm -hmm. and it's an adorable little book. It's like you know, what do you get for someone who really has everything that they need? And it's it's just it's very sweet, and I've kept it for a really long time. And every time I went to give it away. I thought, no, you know, she, she gave this to me and it, and it makes me smile every time I think of it. So it's not like, you right. know, I mean, it's a great thing, but I no longer have need for it. Right. And so this, the, then the last set of things I went through, I actually let it go. Well, and ironically, and okay. the book is written for people who have everything. Yes. <laughs> to remind them that the true gift is not having everything. And now here you are unloading everything because you also agree <laughs> that what you want is the gift of nothing. Nothing. So it's <laughs> yes. perfect time. It it's really perfect. means that the book has done its job and now it's okay to move on and <laughs> heal someone else. Right. <laughs> perfect. Okay. Um, one of the other questions was how to handle all chores while working. Mm. So working mama. Yeah. I think that the key here is the difference between what I call tending the backlog mm. and then maintenance mode because they are two different creatures. Um, we all have a space that when it's set up and running smoothly, just the living in it makes it, need work, right? Things need to be dusted. Floors need to be swept or vacuumed eventually. Um, food, if you put it in the fridge, will eventually spoil and it will need to be cleaned out. Like there's all of this just because we occupy a space, even if we're pristinely behaved, like there's work that's going to happen and that's totally maintenance. And um, when you add to that, the way that we change and evolve and the stuff we need to support us changes and evolves, then we have a couple of layers of maintenance that need to be done. Mail is a daily, almost daily thing. Not that we deal with it almost daily, but that it receive, we receive it almost daily. Um, seasons change. Things come in different ways. Schools now started back for those who send their children away. Now there's lots of papers around. So that is just the maintenance. You know, we use dishes, we wash the dishes, we put them away. And then there's the backlog that happens when we don't do the daily maintenance and the weekly maintenance, the monthly maintenance, the annual maintenance. And so maybe we've gotten to the place where the windows are so dirty that we're like three seasons in and that's a backlog. 
So we get it done and then we're done with it until it's time to do it again. With laundry, the backlog is the big pile of undone laundry as opposed to I do laundry on Sunday, it's Thursday. So there's a tiny bit of laundry, but not even enough to do. Mm. But on Sunday, it's maintenance time. So when we're working on the house, we want to try to keep maintenance mode happening where it has happened, day-to-day living. And then we want to find time for space healing, which is tending to the backlog. And the book has a great strategy. The workshop that's going to start on the 9th will have great strategies for like finding tiny ways to make that happen in your regular life. Um, I'm something of an advocate now of like space healing with a, hmm, how do I say it? Like life hacker kind of perspective. I'm boiling noodles. I have 11 minutes. What can I do with that 11 minutes instead of just standing here looking at Facebook? You know, because you can actually do something <laughs> in 11 minutes. Right. I know. <laughs> I know. Besides Facebook? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but even for people who say, I love to read, I love to read, I love to read, I want to read, but I never read. There's no time for reading. I can't possibly read. That's 11 minutes. Do you know how many words you can read in 11 minutes? Right. A lot, yeah. Right. Or maybe there's some homework you need to tend with the child. Like this is in some ways it's about like hacking our own lives and being more efficient in the lives that we have set up for ourselves. So it's a bit of balance, but that's why we, and that's why the space healing isn't just about pick up this thing and put it there. It's about how to really work this into our lives in a right. sustainable way. Right. I, I think that that's such a good point. I think so many times, especially for working moms, I mean, I'm, I'm a working mom. I work from home most of the time, but oh my gosh, you know, it's that, that distinction of, you know, the things that have to be done every day. And then when you were talking about the, the pile of dishes or whatever, if you don't do them, right. now you're, you know, you're not, that's not maintenance. Um, I'm t- thinking about my, my kids who are trying to learn that lesson right mm-hmm. now. You know, right. they, they wait till there's a backlog, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and I keep trying to explain, you know, if you do this now, you know, it's not a big deal, but they've got to get that, right. <laughs> you know, but I think that it's easy, especially as a working mom, where it's just, there's so many things, it's easy to get backlogged on something. But I think, I think the distinction, maintenance and backlog are just, it's a nice differentiation. Yes. Well, and it just tells us like we need a few minutes a day to move forward on the backlog because that's like, unless you have some help and a place to put the stuff and a big truck to move it down the street, you're going to have to approach the backlog in a methodical sort of slow and steady way. Maintenance is something that if you can't maintain your house day to day, it means your backlog is too big. Hmm. If I can't get all the, the, the laundry done and put away, it means we have too much laundry or the drawers are too full from stuff we don't ever wear. The closets won't receive what I get clean. It's an, it's an indicator when we can't maintain, when our lives won't allow us to maintain the space effectively, it's a great indicator that something is off and some more space healing needs to happen because what you have is an environment that won't support you. You're like wow. a football team whose locker room has you know, no water or, you know, nobody's doing the laundry. Nobody wants to play the football team without someone to wash the uniforms. So, wow. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. We should have talked a couple of years ago, Christy. <laughs> well, we were talking a couple of years ago. <laughs> right. Right. But you know, after that. Yeah. <laughs> In between. Yes. That definition is so helpful. Like, okay, right. My, my space needs to support us. And yes. if not, then we have too many. And, and I, and I had a, and I had a, um, a sense of that, mm-hmm. you know, when, when Trey would spend an entire day washing the towels, mm-hmm. just the towels, right? you know, but it's, but it's naming it like that. Right. I think helps to more clearly define how do you know when it's too much? How do you know when you need to tend to that backlog? Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, how to decide what to keep? Hmm. Is another question. I think everybody has their own criteria. The two things that I use are what is true for me in terms of usefulness today. What am I going to use or what do I love? Those are the only two, for me, they're the only two criteria that feel honest. Mm. 
and not that doesn't include um, the things uh, that I call want to be clutter. Like I want to be the kind of person who sews. And so I had this sewing machine for a very long time. Um, but I just am not, I'm not the kind of person who sews. And so <laughs> I wanted to be the kind of person who did that, but I, I'm not, I wanted to be the kind of person who scrapbooked. And I did, when I first started scrapbooking, I scrapbooked everything up until that summer. And I scrapbooked everybody's lives and my life and the children's lives. And it was wonderful. And I haven't scrapbooked really since then, but I know I'll do it again. I said, I, I know that there'll be a summer. I suspect it won't be next summer, but it might be next summer where I'll just pull out the scrapbooking stuff and then do the second half of the children's lives, um, which is going to require a lot of printing. And <laughs> I will do that. And then someday I'll just hand them these photo albums that were their childhood. And I'm so excited about doing that. But what I realized is that while I, when I started, I bought all of this stuff, a lot of gadgets and different tools. And then I found my style, my technique that I really use and what I need to do that. And then all of the rest of that stuff was just extra and it wasn't serving me at all. And so now I have my scrapbooking is like this little thing, you know, with these basics that when I do have that period of time where I go back and catch up the rest of their childhood, I'll be able to finish without having that whole big, huge, burdensome box of stuff that I wasn't even using anyway. So it's a lot of, when you ask yourself this, the questions, what questions you ask is really important. So it's not, can I use this? It's, am I using this? Right? Because of course we can use basically anything. <laughs> right. right. I can justify anything, but I'm not actually using it. Um, this is actually happening right now in a weird way in my business. I have a lot of ideas and great things. And even people are asking me to do things like there is a retreat that they've been begging me to do in California. Um, I am learning and have learned about myself that I'm a much, I'm not, um, I have some really great skills and I have other things that aren't my strength. And so I know about me that I'm far more well suited for somebody hosting a thing and me being asked to come and speak than I am for me hosting my own thing, right? It's more organic for me to go to your thing and do my thing than it is for me to do my thing myself. Right. And so while I have lots of great skills and I know that I could actually be the facilitator for the entire thing, the planning, the registration, like it's just not true for me. Can I? Yes. If someday the only thing standing between me and a retreat is this and I decide I want to stretch and make it happen, I will. But for now, I have so many other things that I want to do that feel really vital that are about the books I'm writing and about... Um, these intensives I'm teaching and about writing myself, like blogging and stuff, stuff that I just ache to do that I suddenly just two days ago, I was like, I want to do that. I really want there to be a retreat, but I don't want to plan it. Hmm. It feels untrue for me. So letting go of something that people are asking me to do, it was very difficult. It was like somebody had given me a gift if we want you to come here. Um, and I just knew that it wasn't true for me. Mm -hmm. At least at this time, it wasn't how I wanted to use the little bit of resources that we have for planning and living. So um, it's just like the, it's like watching space healing ideas, these, these um, principles you move into my business and my time and my energy and trusting that it's okay to make those decisions. Like it's dreamy that I've got a bunch of people who want me to do a retreat. I love that but it doesn't mean that I should do it. It doesn't mean it's true for me to do it. We have to make those decisions in the house too. Right, right. And so <clears throat> it's really that, it's the questions is what I'm hearing you okay. say. It's the questions Absolutely. that we're asking and it's not, can we use this, but am I using this? Yes. And, and if I'm not, will I? And what will it take to make it possible for me to do that? Because if I'm not willing to do what it takes to make it possible, then that thing can go. Right, right. And that's, and that's um, you know, when, when I was growing up, my mom never really released anything. So I never saw that happening, that process mm -hmm. of, and even asking that question. And 
when I first um, started working, I was a teacher and teachers are notoriously pack radish because, yeah. you know, I don't need this right now, but you know, I'm, I'm, sure, there, next year. I'm yeah. sure there's going to be something that I'm going to need this, you know, stack of 30 magazines for. Absolutely. So I can't get rid of it. Yes. And so, you know, these were my, my beginnings. And so, you know, that question of, am I using it or I, I love your scrapbook example. I think especially as moms, we have that, you know, I really want to do this, but this isn't the season of my life right. where I have the time or the space, but it's important. You yes. know, I really want to be able to knit this thing, but I have a toddler right now and I can't do it. Right. So I will pack those things away. And like you said, going through and seeing what is actually true for you. So it's not putting all the stuff away, you know, okay, all right, big thing, but this thing is true for me. I need these, these tools and I can let the rest go. Absolutely. So, and then there are the things that we love. And, and I think it's, um, it's a lot about um, really feeling your way through it. Um, because there are some things that you, you have in your home and you, you know, like I've been listening to Trey tell all of the stories about all of the things that we have in, in this house. And I didn't know all of the stories right. and the weight of all of these things for him. And so, you know, I, yeah, we can use these things and, and I, but I also see the gift in releasing them and telling the story and letting it go in you know, yeah, um, you know, it, it, it is it, like the couches, you know, they're, they're great, they're fine. Um, but as I was listening to Trey tell the story of it, it's like, you know, I think there's, there's so much weight around this. And when we settle again and we get something else, I think it will feel so much better. Yes. Absolutely. And we had a session earlier this week with a woman um, who had been abused in the home that she still lives in. The person who was abusive is gone. But I was really feeling that in those situations. You know, when we look around our house, what do we, what are we reminded of? Um, I had this one shirt that I really, really, really loved, like really loved loved the way it felt on me, loved the way it looked on me, like really loved it. And I kept it for years and I didn't wear it. And so one day I was doing, you know, probably my 19th version of this workshop because I always do all of the challenges with my clients, which is why I don't have anything left. <laughs> not sure I have plenty of belongings, but not as many as I used to have. Um, and I was in my closet and I thought, okay, I haven't worn this in probably three years and I still haven't let it go. Like, why is it still here? And what I realized is that I loved it so much, but that the last night I wore it, I had an incident with a very good friend and it was heartbreaking. And every time I looked at that shirt, that's what I remembered. Yeah. So my love for the piece of fabric that was the shirt was there, but my discomfort about the memory associated with it was bigger. Mm -hmm. Right. I couldn't bring myself to wear it, to give it new memories for association. So I finally just released it. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff around us. I think we keep a lot of things to remember, but then when we check in, we recognize that we're remembering something that we don't actually need to be reminded of and something that we're being reminded of a really shadowy aspect. Um, people who have loved ones who die are almost always like that, 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 particular kind of stuckness is hard mm -hmm. and I will talk to people and they'll still have the basket of medicines from when they were caregiving for their parent and their parent died and it was three years ago and I'm like are those medicines really the thing you want to remind you of your relationship with your parents do you want this painful time in your togetherness to be remembered or are there more positive things that you could be reminded of so there's a lot of just challenging the assumptions here. That's really what we're doing. I'm assuming these things are going to stay. That's why they're all here. And now I need to challenge that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And this, this process has been so interesting in just really looking at, all right, this is what we have. Why? Why do we have it? Mm -hmm. and, and do we love it enough to put it in storage? Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, right. and pay to store it or, Absolutely. or does it need to go? And, you know, and, and what are the stories around that? And I think that was something that you, you said pretty early on to me, you know, have a space for those stories. And Trey really took that to heart. You know, that's a lot of what he's writing about are like the associated memories and the yeah. stream of consciousness stuff yeah. that comes up for him as he looks at all these different things. And he says, he was saying this last night, and then I write about it. And then I'm ready to release it. Every time, yes. Mm -hmm. And there are times when just doing that isn't enough, but then it's like, okay, so then what, what remains? It, you know, sometimes what we find is that we write it, we tell it, we tell the story, and we still have a little bit of hanging on, say a wedding dress for a relationship that's ended, or maybe one that hasn't, but you're just tired of seeing it hang there. Just saying, this is what I got married in isn't enough. But talking about like, why that dress? Why did I pick that dress? what was perfect about it? What didn't I like about it? You know, I happen to have been married three times and I still haven't had a wedding dress. Um, I had a white dress and I had a, the second dress was lovely. Um, and I had it made for me, but it was gray and I would wear it tonight if I went out, if I still had it, but I've still not, when I look at wedding pictures, I still haven't had the dress. And that's part of my story, you know, is, is like if I were to marry again, if I can get the beautiful one to marry me, um, part of it is going to be like, I want some sort of closure around that big story. I want to figure out what it is that is true for me in that moment. And I want to be able to do it, whatever needs to happen for that to be, you know, able to happen. Um, so we just have to figure out what the hook is. Sometimes we have to dig for it. Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes we need a little extra support. And I know yeah. that's something that you offer. And, you know, I know that I help people through stuck places too. So, you know, if you, if you want that extra layer of support, we just wanted to let you know that we, we do offer it. Um, okay. So <laughs> I like this one. How do you get others to contain their stuff out of shared spaces? Once you have established that there's shared spaces and private spaces and everybody knows where their private spaces are, it becomes more about the discipline of requiring that. So if it's at the end of the day, you say, everybody get your stuff and take it to your space. Great. If they don't do it, that's when you have to have some strategy, right? If you forget to say it for a few days and all of a sudden there's a lot of chaos again, well then that's on you. Like what do you need to do to ask that or to prompt everyone? Or maybe you don't need to prompt everyone, but maybe they just need to say like every night before I go to bed, I know one of the things I do is brush my teeth and another one is I go gather up my stuff, right? Or maybe it's, okay, everybody kind of get your stuff put away, we're gonna have dinner. Whatever becomes that maintenance, again, maintenance mode action, then, you're probably going to be the reinforcer for a while. If you have somebody who rebels, you have some options. And the options are as simple and subtle and sweet and kind as to maybe putting things that are in the floor on the stairs so that somebody might see them and take them up. It may be as aggressive as if your stuff isn't put away, I'm going to put it away in time out. I've seen people put baskets on top of the fridge that things are just in there for a week because they couldn't get them to be, you know, pick them up. That's fine. And then you can go to the other extreme, which is more of a, mm, how do I say? It's more of a intensive recovery healing sort of approach, which is that obviously this usually child, not always, but usually has not does not have a healthy relationship with stuff and we have to kind of backtrack a little bit to heal that so a two-year-old should have a two-year-old's worth of stuff a three-year-old should have a three-year-old's worth of stuff and a four-year-old should have a four-year-old's worth of stuff and i think a lot of our kids have way more stuff than is developmentally appropriate and so sometimes what you end up with is a 12 year old who acts like a two-year-old with their stuff because they've never had a good relationship with stuff they've never had that kind of discipline to put things away or they've never really had enough space to do that so we have to kind of backtrack and let them heal at that two-year-old layer by removing the excess and when they can manage a two-year-old's level of stuff then they move to a three-year-old's level of stuff and a four-year-old's level of stuff and sort of reintegrating stuff as they show that they can manage what they had before Right. And it doesn't have to be a punitive no, thing at all. Is, and I think never intended to be punitive. Right. 
And I think I just wanted to name it because yes. some, because some parents um, may take that as, oh, okay, well, I just have to go in. Well, you can't handle your stuff. And, yes. so, and it's not, it's coming from a very loving place Absolutely. of, yeah, you know what? This is too much. This is like, this is us saying we let you down when you were two by giving you a seven year old's worth of stuff. We let you down when you were eight by giving you, you know, a 16 year old's worth of stuff. We let you down by not going with you to the beginning and growing this boundary and this relationship with stuff in a healthy way. So we have to go back and heal, right? This is like all the other healing work we do. We go back to those early wounds and we fix it. We heal it. We make amends. We, you know, show that younger version of ourselves, what's an appropriate way to establish this relationship. And then we grow it in a very, you know, organically maturing way, even though that human is older, it can still be healed retroactively in that way. Mm -hmm. So, and it's never intended to be punitive. It is often painful, but it, it really can, that approach can cultivate healing. If you have a situation where there's a radical problem. Mm. Thank you for that, Christy. I think, I think that's a good point. You know, I mean, I remember when my kids were little, they, and, and we had to really set some boundaries around how many things our, you know, our, our son was getting. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. And it was way more than I could manage. It was, and I was a grown up, right. <laughs> you know, and it was of course, way, 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 way more than he could manage. And it's interesting as he grew, we, you know, just kept paring down and paring down and paring down. And now he's my minimalist. I mean, he's the right. one who's going to be the easiest to move because he yeah. has the fewest things, Right. but he takes good care of the things he has, Yes. you know, and it's, but it's like, I think it's so easy when we're just starting on this journey to ha to look around and go, Oh my gosh, you know, there is so much here. It's overwhelming for me. Mm -hmm. And it's it, back to gifts. Like we were talking about earlier and all of the things that are just coming in. Um, and then not really having a good relationship ourselves and, and knowing how to handle those things, you know, not knowing how to handle the relationship with the person who's gifting you know, navigating that as a new parent is challenging. And then yeah. now I've got all this stuff and I didn't think you could give it back when you said that, you know, that's a radical idea, yeah. you know, or, or pass it on. You didn't have to keep it. You got to make a choice about it. Absolutely. And yeah. you're talking about for anybody who hasn't seen it, she's talking about in the book because I didn't say it here, but that when you receive a gift, if the gift is really meaningful and it's something that no longer feels true for you, that I am a huge advocate of just checking in with the person who gave it to you and saying, this item no longer feels true for me, with or without an explanation. And just saying, you know, before I release it, I wanted to check with you to see if it was true for you. Because we often give gifts, which are things we would love to receive. So there's a good chance that if you have this amazing scarf that's beautiful and wonderful, but it's just not your color, that the person who gave it to you, it might be exactly what they wanted that day, wouldn't buy for themselves. So it's kind of a real act of love to have the courage to just speak the truth about a gift huh. what feels best for the giver that's really interesting i mean it makes perfect sense but i just hadn't thought about it quite that way well we're all like living in the shame right of like <laughs> your gift you bought me isn't the perfect thing that i wanted to have in my pillow for the next 60 years so that shame is false like that's totally just not even real and right. if we have the courage to speak into it even though we have all this societal crap telling us we shouldn't um, lots of healing can happen for us and for the other person. Right, right. But just that, even just that idea that, of course, someone is giving something that they would also, that, that, you know, that they may want. Right. And, and, and what a gift that is to even, if you have the courage to bring it up. I mean, yes. that's, that's, that's a very radical idea. I appreciate that, Christy. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I actually have this same situation right now. So this particular question was relevant for me as well. I have clothes in my closet with spots and I don't want to trash them because I feel they can be recycled. Can they be recycled? Thanks. Um, yes, they can. And it's not up to... Hmm. I don't think that we have a responsibility to get a shirt that is stained or is missing a button or whatever has a hole in it 
we don't have a responsibility to get that on somebody else's back. I don't think we do, but I have done everything from simply donating them and knowing that the people who can put a new button on the shirt with ease, are there shopping, buying that shirt from wherever I donated it to because they can hem it or put a button on it or fix the hole with ease. They are out in the world looking for things that we didn't have it in us to fix and they're going to make it happen. And that by donating it, I put it in their hands. There are going to be other people like I have a friend that I just found out does like this mending of stuff, but she does it with these like, very purposeful, very external, very visible patches, you know, heart shaped patches, star shaped patches, different contrary fabrics that'll, you know, be very noticeable. So if I had a favorite pair of jeans and I wanted that on them, I might recruit her and say, okay, let me trade or, you know, pay you for that mending. Um, I have taken favorite things and had that fabric turned into something else. I had an apron that I bought years and years and years ago and it didn't have the, uh, the strain that I had in my head. It didn't have one. And I had a very specific thing. I looked everywhere for it. I probably had this apron that I loved for 10 years. And just two weeks ago, Gianni turned it into a purse for me, which I Aww. use every day and I'm madly in love with, right? She sewed it exactly the way I like my bags. It's over the shoulder. It has two pockets on the outside. I mean, it's dreamy. I love this bag. And it's because I just fell in love with this apron 10 years ago and I just hung on to it. And I was like, I either have to release this or find a way to use it. And she's like, but you want me to make you a purse? I was like, yes, please make me a purse. So she did. I think that the moral of the story is that you need to get the thing out of your life unless you have the energy to deal with it. So if having a pile somewhere where you put all the stained things means that once a quarter, once every six months, you go in and spend a half of a day treating, washing, retreating, rewashing, and getting that basket emptied, mending, you can do that. If that's what maintenance mode looks like for you, do that. But if you're never going to take the half a day to get that basket of things emptied, healed, donate them, get them off of your hands so somebody else can get their hands on them. Maybe they'll buy it and maybe they'll turn it into a purse. Like it's not, you don't have to, you don't have to carry it down the river yourself you get to just put it in the river and let somebody else pick it up when they see it. And that's what they want. Hmm. And if you're not going to use it, let it go. If you're not going to do the thing, if that's a wishful thinking thing, let it go. There's no reason to burden yourself with that. All right. Well, I'm going to let that, that sweater I have with the stain on it go. I was thinking I was going to, but I just thought that was a great question. It is a great question. Yeah. Because yeah. What, uh, is there another way that, you know, that I love, I love that, that you had the apron and it was turned into a purse. Right. And you know me, that. like I've been doing this for almost five years. And so it was a big deal that this thing was, had survived all of the other, Yeah. Like, have a box of random fabric anymore. Like this one, it was like this one thing that when she had a box of fabric, I was like, um, my apron's going to go in there. And it was like, <laughs> okay. We have to deal with the apron. So, mm. yes. So I awesome. see that we're almost out of time. Is there another good question or are we? I was reading. There's one, one last question. So uh, I think this is just a comment. Um, it's, uh, this, this comment is, I listened to last week's program earlier this morning. It was great news because my unorganized cluttered house does not make me happy. Mm -hmm. I may also be downsizing in a year or two. So thanks, Rebecca and Christy. Perfect. So that was the last one. Good. So, yeah. Well, that so, was very time fitting. It was. That's, that's I thought, really oh, she's really going to push it here to see if I can pull something brilliant off in three minutes. <laughs> I didn't. Well, you probably could. I mean, I really have no doubt that you could. I don't know. Being brief isn't really my strong suit. It's fine. <laughs> it is fine. So, so I am, I have nine days left okay. and um, I am, like I said, I'm working. My next thing is, um, getting the stuff that we know is going to storage, get it. We're renting the truck where we sold the piano. So we're going to actually deliver that. We're going to, okay. we're going to get a truck with a lift gate so that we can, you know, put it up and then bring it down so we can just roll it. And, um, 
And then I'm going to really reevaluate what else we still have here. And I think I'm going to need you a whole lot. Um, over I'm available a whole lot. So <laughs> next time we do this, and maybe even if you have to, let's say it's Friday, so that's Saturday. So maybe even Sunday, if not Monday, maybe we just could do like video, um, you have an iPhone or something, we could use like a video tour. And uh-huh. you can point to things and we could talk about them because I think that's what happens is we just get like, 90% of a room will be emptied and then there's the 10% that's left and that 10% is really the hardest stuff. So yeah. we yeah. can just play that way if you're okay. Interested. Yeah. And I think so. Cause like my desk is all still set up here. Good. Which is great because I'm using it. Yes. But sometime soon I'm going to have to take it apart. <laughs> right. So yeah, so it is, I think you're right. It's the hardest. I'd say that was always the biggest surprise for me when, when I you know, first started really moving was you think, all right, we got this, we got this right. taken care of, we got this. And then you get down to the last stuff and that's the stuff that takes forever. Yes. The last 10%, it will always be known as because one of my clients was like had done about 70% probably before we started working together and the next 20% went just fine. And the last 10% was like painful, but it <sighs> is done. Right. She's Woo-hoo. completely in maintenance mode. So that's yeah, awesome. It can happen. I'm looking forward to it. Yes. <laughs> All right, Christy. Thank you. And thank you for those of you who are listening live and thank you to those of you who've listened later. If you have additional questions, we're doing this again next week. Feel free to send those questions in to us. You can hit reply to uh, an email that you got from me. Um, you can go on Facebook, um, chase me down, chase Christy down. Um, you can go to the unruly woman, um, on Facebook, um, and Christy's website, the unruly woman.com. Yes. And And also if anybody is interested in the very, very recently committed to as in (laughs) like last night, (laughs) um, space healing intensive, we're going to do a 21 day space healing bonanza if you will um, (laughs) in starting on September 9th so if you want more I don't have that page set up yet or anything like that but if you want if you want that information you can email me at christy at the unruelywoman.com all right thanks christy thank you all right well we will talk to you all later hope you have a great day yes bye bye